All right, we're all together. Welcome everyone to the Elmwood Playhouse Public Domain Players reading of Shakespeare's Measure to Measure, slightly condensed. And today is January 22nd, 2022. And I'm very pleased that we have such a talented cast here. Um, and just a word to our sponsor, Elmwood Playhouse uh, sponsors these readings. And uh, this reading is completely free, but if you like what you see and you want to support us, please visit www.elmwoodplayhouse.com to, to make a donation and any small donation is welcome. So uh, with that, my name is Derek Tarson. I am the playmaster and uh, I will also be playing Angelo and I will introduce the rest of the cast. So um, we're going to start with Polly. I'm Polly Corman. I'll be playing the Duke and the Friar. And um, looking forward. Okay. Uh, Arthur. Arthur Chill. I am playing Aeschylus. Sean. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Sean Coffey, uh, and I'm playing Claudio and Friar Thomas. Uh, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon, Kevin Masbeck. I am playing Lucio, friend to Claudio. Uh, John. Oops, hi, I'm Johnny Culver and I'm playing Pompeii. Okay. Uh, Andrew. I'm Andrew Dynan and I'm playing the provost. Okay. Uh, Gabby. Gabby Galgano, I'm playing Isabella. Okay. Uh, Marion. Hi, I'm Marion Breland, and I'll be playing Mariana. Uh, Ginny. Hi, I'm Ginny Borton, and I'm playing Second Gentleman, Justice, Juliet, Messenger, and Friar Peter. And Maxine. Maxine Bernstein, and I'm playing Mistress Overton, the board, Francisca, the nun, elbow, and servant. Excellent. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. If you could would turn off your uh, videos and I will uh, start by setting up the scene. All right, act one, scene one, Vienna. Uh, enter Duke, Aeschylus, Lords and Attendants. Aeschylus. The properties to unfold would seem in me to affect speech and discourse, since I am put to know that your own science exceeds in that the lists of all advice my strength can give you. Then no more remains but that to your sufficiency as your worth is able and let them work. The nature of our people, our cities, institutions, and the terms for common justice you're as pregnant in as art, as art and practice have enriched any that we remember. And there is our commission, from which we would not have you walk. Call hither, I say, bid come before us, Angelo. What figure of us think you he will bear? For you must know, we have, with special soul, elected him our absence to supply, lent him our terror, dressed him with our love, and given his deputation all the organs of our own power. What think you of it? If in an, any in Vienna be of worth to undergo such ample grace and honor, it is Lord Angelo. Look where he comes. Always obedient to your grace as well. I come to know your pleasure. Angelo, there is a kind of character in thy life that to the observer doth thy history fully unfold. Thyself and thy belongings are not thine own so proper as to waste thyself upon thy virtues, they on thee. Heaven doth with us as we with torches do, not light them for ourselves. For if our virtues did not go forth of us, for all alike as if we had them not. Spirits are not finely touched, but to fine issues, nor nature never lends the smallest scruple of her excellence. But 
like a thrifty goddess, she determines herself the glory of a creditor, both thanks and use. <laughs> but I defend my speech to one that can my part in him advertise. Hold, therefore, Angelo, in our remove, be thou at full ourself. Mortality and mercy in Vienna live in thy tongue and heart. Old Aeschylus, though first in question, is thy secondary. Take thy commission. Now, good my lord, let there be some more test made of my metal before so noble and so great a figure be stamped upon it. No more invasion. We have with leavened and prepared choice proceeded to you. Therefore, take your honours. Our haste from hence is of a so quick condition that it prefers itself and leaves unquestioned matters of needful value. If we shall write to you as Time and our concerning shall importune how it goes with us, and do look to know what doth befall you here. So, farewell to thy hopeful execution do I leave of your commissions. Uh, yet uh, give leave, my lord, that we may bring you something on the way. My haste may not admit it, nor need you on mine honour have to do with any scruple. Your scope? is as mine own, so enforce or qualify the laws as to your soul seems good. Give me your hand, I'll privily away. I love the people, but do not like to stage me to their eyes, though it do well. I do not relish well their loud applause and Ave is vehement, nor do I think the man of safe discretion that does affect it. Once more, fare you well. The heavens give safety to your purposes. Lay forth and bring you back in happiness. I thank you. Fare thee well. I shall desire you, sir, to give me leave to have free speech with you, and it concerns me to look into the bottom of my place. The power I have, but of what strength and nature I am not yet instructed. <sighs> Tis so with me. Let us withdraw together, and we may soon our satisfaction have uh, touching that point. I wait upon your honour. Scene two. Enter Lucio and two other gentlemen. If the Duke or the other Dukes come not to composition with the King of Hungary, why, then all the Dukes fall upon the King. <laughs> Heaven grant shall sit peace, but not the Kings of Hungries. Behold, behold, when Madam Mitigation comes, I've perched as many diseases under her roof as come to... To what, I pray? <laughs> Judge. <laughs> oh, to three thousand dollars a year. How now, which of your hips has the most profound sciatica? <laughs> well, well. There's one yonder arrested and carted to prison with her. Five thousand of you all. Who's that, I pray thee? Who oh, marry, sir? That's Claudio. Signor Claudio. <clears throat> Claudio to prison. Tis not so. Nay, but I know tis so. I saw him arrested. Saw him carted away. And which is more, within these three days, his head to be chopped off. After all this fooling, I would not have it so. Art thou sure on this? I am too sure of it. And it is forgetting Madame Julietta with child. Uh, believe me, this may be. He promised to meet me two hours since, and he was ever precise in promise keeping. Away, let's go learn the truth of it. Gosh, what with the war, what with the sweat, and what with the gallows, and what with. Poverty. I am custom shrunk. How oh, now? What's news with you? Yonder man is carried to prison. Well, what has he done? A woman. What was his offense? Groping for trout in a particular river, peculiar what? river. What? Is there a maid with child by him? No, but there's a woman with maid by him. You have not heard the proclamation, have you? What proclamation's name? All houses in the suburbs of Vienna must be plucked down. And what shall become of those in the city? 
they shall stand for seed. They had gone down too, but th that that a wise burger put in for them. Which shall all our houses of resort in the suburbs be pulled down? To the ground, mistress. What? There's a change indeed in the commonwealth. What shall become of me? Uh, come, fear not you. Good counselors lack no clients. Though you change your place, you need not change your trade. I'll be your tapster still. Courage, there will be pity taken on you. You that have worn your eyes almost out in the service, you will be considered. What to do here, Thomas Tapster? Let's withdraw. Uh, here comes Signor Claudio, led by the provost to prison. And there's Madame Juliet. Fellow, why dost thou show me thus to the world and bear me to prison where I am committed? I do it not in evil disposition, but from Lord Angelo by special charge. Thus can the demigod authority make us pay down for our offense by weight. The words of heaven on whom it will, it will, on whom it will not so, yet still tis just. Why, how now, Claudio? Whence comes this restraint? Oh, from too much liberty, my Lucio, liberty. As surefit is the father of much fast, so every scope by the immoderate use turns to restraint. Our natures do pursue like rats that raven down their proper beta, a thirsty evil, and when we drink, we die. <laughs> if I could speak so wisely under the rest, I would send for certain of my creditors. And yet to say the truth, I just life have the foppery of freedom as the mortality of imprisonment. <laughs> What's thy offense, Clavio? Oh, what but to speak of would offend again. What is murder? No. Lechery? Uh, call it so. A away, sir, you, you must go. Uh, uh, one word, good friend. Lucio, a word with you. A hundred if they'll do you any good? Is lechery so looked after? Thus it stands, it, thus stands it with me. Upon a true contract, I got possession of Julietta's bed. Uh, you know the lady. She is fast my wife, save that we do the denunciation lack of outward order. This we came not to, only for propagation of a dower remaining in the coffer of her friends, from whom we thought it meet to hide our love till time had made them for us. Uh, but it chances the stealth of our most mutual entertainment with character too gross is writ on Juliet. With child, perhaps. Oh, unhappily, even so. And the new deputy now for the Duke, uh, whether it be the fault or and glimpse of newness, or whether that the body politic be uh, a horse whereon the governor doth ride, who newly in the seat that it may know he can command, let it straight feel the spur. Whether the tyranny be in his place or in his eminence that fills it up, I stagger in. But this new governor awakes me all the enrolled penalties which had like unscoured armor hung by the wall so long that nineteen zodiacs have gone round and none of them been worn. And for a name now puts the drowsy and neglected act freshly on me. Tis surely for a name. I warrant it is. In thy head stands so tickle on thy shoulders that a milkmaid, if she be in love, May sigh it off. <laughs> Send after the Duke and appeal to him. I have done so, but he's not to be found. I, I, I prithee, Lucio, do me this kind service. This day my sister should the cloister enter, and there receive her approbation. Acquaint her with the danger of my state. Implore her in my voice that she make friends to the strict deputy. Bid herself assay him. I have great hope in that, for in her youth there is a prone and speechless dialect such as move men. Besides, she hath a prosperous art when she will play with reason and discourse, and well she can persuade. <laughs> I pray she may as well as for the encouragement of the like, which else would stand and agree this imposition. As for the enjoying of thy life, who I would be sorry should be thus foolishly lost at a game of tic tac. I'll to her. I thank you, good friend Lucio. Well, within two hours. Come, officer, away. They exit. Enter Duke and Friar Thomas. Why I desire thee to give me secret harbor hath a purpose more grave and wrinkled than the aims and ends of burning youth. Uh, may your grace speak of it? 
I have delivered to Lord Angelo, a man of stricture and firm abstinence, my absolute power here in Vienna, and he supposes me to travel to Poland, for so I have strewed it in the common ear, and so it is received. Now, pious sir, you will demand of me why I do this. Oh, gladly, my lord. We have strict statutes and most biting laws, the needful bits and curbs to headstrong weeds, which for this 14 years we have let slip, like even like an o'ergrown lion in a cave that goes not out to prey. Now, as fond fathers, having bound up the threatening twigs of birch only to stick it in their children's sight for terror not to use, so our decrees and liberty plucks justice by the nose. The baby beats the nurse, and quite a thwart goes all decorum. Oh, it rested in your grace to unloose this tied-up justice when you pleased, and it in you more dreadful would have seemed than in uh, Lord Angela. I do fear too dreadful. If it was my fault to give the people scope, it would be my tyranny to strike and gall them for what I bid them do. For we bid this be done when evil deeds have their permissive pass, and not the punishment. Therefore, indeed, my father, I have on Angelo imposed the office, who may, in the ambush of my name, strike home. And to behold his sway, I will, as twere a brother of your order, who may, uh, therefore, visit both prince and people. Therefore, I prithee, supply me with the habit and instruct me how I may formally, in person, bear more like a true friar. More reasons for this action at our more leisure shall I render you. Only this one, Lord Angelo scarce confesses that his blood flows or that his appetite is more to bread than to stone. Hence, we shall see if power changes purpose, what our seamers be. They exit. Scene four. Enter Isabella and Francisca, a nun. And have you nuns no further privileges? Are these not large enough? Yes, truly. I speak not as desiring more, but rather wishing a more strict restraint upon the sisterhood, the votarists of St. Clair. Oh, be bids, place. Who's that which calls? It is a man's voice. Gentle Isabella, turn you the key and know his business of him. You may, I may not. You are yet unsworn. When you have vowed, you must not speak with men, but in the presence of the prioress. Then, if you speak, you must not show your face. Or, if you show your face, you must not speak. He calls again. I, I pray you answer him. Peace and prosperity. Who is it that calls? Hail, virgin. <laughs> if you be, <laughs> as those cheek roses proclaim, you are no less. <laughs> Can you so stead me as bring me to the sight of Isabella, a novice of this place and fair sister to her unhappy brother, Claudio? Why her unhappy brother? Let me ask the rather, for I now must make you know I am that Isabella and his sister. Gentle and fair, your brother kindly greets you. Not to be wary with you, he's in prison. Woe me, for what? <laughs> for that which, if myself might be his judge, he should receive his punishment in thanks. He's got his friend, the child. Sir, make me not your story. What is true? I hold you as a thing inskied and sainted by your renouncement in immortal spirit, and to be talked with in sincerity, as with a saint. <laughs> you do blaspheme the good in mocking me. Uh, your brother and his lover have embraced. Mm? <laughs> as those that feed grow full. Um, as blossoming time that from the seedness the bare fallow brings to teeming foison. <laughs> uh, uh, even so, her plenteous womb express this is full to thin husbandry. <laughs> Someone with child by him? My is cousin, she, Is she your cousin? Adoptedly, as schoolmaids change their names by vain though apt affection. She's it. Oh, let him marry her. 
This is the point. The Duke is very strangely gone from hence, upon his place and with full line of authority, governs Lord Angelo, a man whose blood is very snow broth, one who never feels the wanton stings in motions of sense, but doth rebate and blunt his natural edge with profits of the mind, study and fast. Uh, he, to give fear to use and liberty, hath picked out an act, under whose heavy sense your brother's life falls into forfeit. He arrests him on it and follows close the rig of the statute to make him an example. <laughs> All hope is gone unless you have the grace by your fair prayer to soften Angelo. And that's my pith of business to you and your poor brother. Doth he so seek his life? Uh, has censured him already. And as I hear, the provost hath a warrant for his sex execution. Alas, what pours ability in me to do him good? Say the powers you have. My power? Alas, I doubt. Ah, 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 our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. Go to Lord Angelo and let him learn to know when maidens sue, men give like gods, but when they weep, and kneel, all their petitions are as freely theirs as they themselves would owe them. I'll see what I can do. But speedily. I will about it straight, no longer staying but to give the mother notice of my affair. I humbly thank you. Commend me to my brother. Soon at night I'll send him certain word of my success. I take my leave of you. Good sir, adieu. They exit. Act two, scene one. Enter Angelo, Aeschylus, servants, and a justice. Now, we must not make a scarecrow of the law, setting it up to fear the birds of prey and let it keep one shape till custom make it their perch and not their terror. Aye, but yet let us be keen and rather cut a little and fall and bruise to death. Alas, this gentleman, whom I would save, had a most noble father. Let but your honor know, whom I believe to be most straight in virtue, that in the working of your own affections had time coerced with place, or place with wishing, or that the resolute acting of your blood could have attained the effect of your own purpose whether you had not some time in your life erred in this point, which now you censure him, and pulled the Lord upon it. Tis one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. I not deny the jury passing on the prisoner's life may in the sworn twelve have a thief or two guiltier than him they try. What's open made the justice that justice seizes? What knows the laws that thieves do pass on thieves? It's very pregnant. The jewel that we find, we stoop and take because we see it. But what we do not see, we tread upon and never think of it. You may not so extenuate his offense, for I have had such faults, but rather tell me when I that censure him do offend, let mine own judgment pattern out my death, and nothing come impartial. Sir, he must die. Be it as your wisdom will. Where's the provost? Here, if it like your honor. Uh, see that Angelo be executed by nine tomorrow morning. Bring him his confessor, let him be prepared. But that's yeah. the utmost of his pilgrimage. Well, heaven forgive him and forgive us all. Some rise by sin and some by virtue fall. Uh, Elder Elbow and Pompey. How now, sir? Uh, what's your name and what's the matter? If it please your honor, I am the poor Duke's constable and my name is Elbow. I do lean upon justice, sir, and do bring in here before your good honor a notorious benefactor. A benefactor? <laughs> well, what benefactor is he? Is he not a malefactor? Well, if it pleases your honor, 
I know not well what he is, but a precise villain. That I am sure of, and void of all profanation in the world that good Christians ought to have. This comes off well. Here's a wise officer. <laughs> what are you, sir? He's uh, a tapster, sir. Parcel board. One that serves a bad woman whose house, sir, was, as they say, plucked down in the suburbs. And now she professes a hot house, which I think is a very ill house, too. Come you hither to me, Master Tapster. What's your name, Master Tapster? Pompey. What else? Bum, sir. Troth and your bum is the greatest thing about you, so that in the beastliest sense, you are Pompey the Great. Pompey, you are partly a board here so well. Howsoever, you color it, color it in being a tapster, are you not? Come tell me, true, it shall be the better for you. Truly, sir, I am a poor fellow that would live. How would you live, Pompey? By being a bored? What do you think of the trade, Pompey? Is it a lawful trade? If the law would allow it, sir. But the law will not allow it, Pompey, nor it shall not be allowed in Vienna. Does your worship mean to geld and splay all the youth of the city? No, Pompey. Truly, sir. In my poor opinion, they will they will do it then. If, if, if this law hold in Vienna 10 year, I'll rent the fairest house in after a three pence at bay. If, if you live to see this come to pass, say Pompey told you so. Thank you, good Pompey. And in requiem of your prophecy, hark you, I advise you let me not find you before me again upon any complaint whatsoever, nor not for dwelling where you do. If I do, Pompey, I shall beat you to your tent and prove a shrewd Caesar to you. In plain dealing, Pompey, I shall have you whipped. So for this time, Pompey, there you will. I thank your worship for your good counsel, but I shall follow it as the flesh and fortune shall better determine me. Whip me, ha, huh, the valiant's heart not whipped out of his trade. Come hither to me. Uh, look, you bring me in the names of some six or seven, the most sufficient of your parish. To your worship's house, sir? To my house, fare you well. Elbow and the officers exit. Uh, what o'clock think you? Eleven, sir. I pray you home to dinner with me. Oh, I humbly thank you. It grieves me for the death of Claudio, but there's no remedy. Mm, Lord Angelo is severe. It is but needful. Mercy is not itself that oft looks so. Pardon is still the nurse of second woe. But yet, poor Claudio, there is no remedy. Come, sir. They exit. Scene two, enter a provost and a servant. He's hearing of a cause, he will come straight. I'll tell him of you. Pray you do. His pleasure, maybe he will relent. Alas, he hath but of offended in a dream. All sex, all ages, smack of his vice, and he to die for. Uh, now, uh, what's the matter, Provost? Is it your will Claudius shall die tomorrow? Did I not tell thee, yea? Hadst thou not order? Why dost thou ask me again? Lest I might be too rash, under your good correction, I have seen when, after execution, judgment hath repented over his doom. Go to. Let that be mine. Do you your office, or give up your place, and you shall be well spared. Uh, I crave your honor's pardon. What shall be done, sir, with the groaning Juliet? She's very near her hour. Dispose of her to some more fitter place, and that with speed. Here 
Here's the sister of the man condemned desires access to you. Hath he a sister? Ah, oh, my good lord, a very virtuous maid, and to be shortly of a sisterhood, if not already. Well, uh, let her be admitted. See you the fornicatress be removed. Let her have needful, but not lavish means. There shall be an order for it. Save your honor. Uh, uh, stay a little while. Uh, you are welcome. Uh, what's your will? I am a woeful suitor to your honor. Please, but your honor hear me. Well, what's your suit? There is a vice that most I do abhor and most desire should meet the blow of justice for which I would not plead, but that I must, for which I must not plead, but that I am at war twixt will and will not. Well, the matter. I have a brother is condemned to die. I do beseech you, let it be his fault and not my brother. Heaven give thee moving graces. Condemn the fault and not the actor of it? Why, every fault's condemned ere it be done. Mine were the very cipher of a function to find the fault whose fine stands in record and let go by the act. Oh, just but severe law. I had a brother. Heaven keep your honor. Over to so, to him again entreat him, kneel down before him, hang upon his gown. You're too cold. If you should need a pin, you would not with more tame a tongue decide it. To him, I say. Must he needs die? Maiden, no remedy. Yes, I do think that you might pardon him, and neither heaven nor man grieve at the mercy. I will not do it. But can you, if you would? Look what I will not, that I cannot do. But might you do it, and do the world no wrong, if so your heart were touched with that remorse as mine is to him? He's sentenced, tis too late. You're too cold. Too late? Why, no. I that do speak a word may call it back again. Well, believe this. No ceremony that to great ones longs, not the king's crown, nor the deputed sword, the marshal's truncheon, nor the judge's robe become them with one half so good a grace as mercy does. If he had been as you and you as he, you would have slipped like him, but he like you would not have been so stern. Pray you be gone. I would to heaven I had your potency and you were Isabel. Should it be then thus? No, I would tell what twere to be a judge and what a prisoner. <laughs> I touch him. There's the vein. Your brother is a forfeit of the law, and you but waste your words. Alas, alas, why, all the souls that were forfeit once, and he that might the vantage best have took, found out the remedy. How would you be? if he which is the top of judgment should but judge you as you are. Oh, think on that, and mercy then will breathe within your lips like man new made. Be you content, fair maid, it is the law, not I condemn your brother. Were he my kinsman, brother, or my son, it should be thus with him. He must die tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, that sudden spare him, spare him. He's not prepared for death. Even for our kitchens, we kill the fowl of season. Shall we serve heaven with less respect than we do minister to our gross selves? Good, good, my Lord, bethink you. Who is it that hath died for this offense? There's many have committed it. I well said. The law hath not been dead, though it hath slept. Those many had not dared do that evil if the first that be did the edict infringe had answered for the deed. Now tis awake, Take, takes note of what is done, and like a prophet, looks in a glass that shows what future evils, either now 
or by remiss, remissness new conceived, and so in progress to be hatched and born, are now to have no successive degrees, but ere they live to end. Yet show some pity. I show it most when I show justice, but then I pity those I do not know, which a dismissed offense would after gall, and do him a right that answering one foul wrong lives not to act another. Be satisfied. Your brother dies tomorrow. Be content. So you must be the first that gives this sentence? And he that suffers? Oh, it is excellent to have a giant strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. Oh, that's well said. Could great men thunder as Jove himself does, Jove would never be quiet, for every pelting petty officer would use his heaven for thunder, nothing but thunder. Merciful heaven, thou rather with thy sharp and sulfurous bolt splits the unwedgeable and gnarled oak than the soft myrtle. But man, proud man dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence like an angry ape plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven and makes the angels weep with who our spleens would all themselves laugh mortal. To him, to whom, wench, he will relent. He's coming, I perceive it. Pray heaven she win him. We cannot weigh our brother with ourself. Great men may jest with saints, tis wit in them, but in the less foul profanation. Thou art in the right girl more that. That in the captain's but a choleric word, which in the soldier is a flat blasphemy. I'm advised of that, uh, more on it. Why do you put these sayings upon me? Because authority, though it err like others, hath yet a kind of medicine in itself that skins the vice or the top. Go to your bosom, knock there, and ask your heart what it doth know that's like my brother's fault. If it confess a natural guiltiness such as his, let it not sound thought upon your tongue against my brother's life. She speaks. And tis such sense that my sense breeds with it. Fare you well. Gentle, my lord, turn back. I will bethink me. Uh, come again tomorrow. Hark how I'll bribe you, good, my lord, turn back. How? Bribe me. I, with such gifts that heaven shall share with you. You mortal else. Not with fond sickles of the tested gold or stones whose rate are either rich or poor as fancy values them, but with true prayers that shall be up at heaven and enter there ere sunrise. Prayers from preserved souls, from fasting maids whose minds are dedicate to nothing temporal. Well, come to me tomorrow. Go to, go to, tis well, away, away. Heaven, keep your honor safe. Amen. For I am that way going to temptation where prayers cross. At what hour tomorrow shall I attend your lordship? At any time, forenoon. Save your honor. From thee, even from thy virtue. What's this? What's this? Is this her fault or mine? The tempter or the tempted? Who sins most? <laughs> Not she, nor doth she tempt. But it is I that lying by the violet in the sun do as the carrion does, not as the flower, corrupt with virtuous season. Can it be that Modesty may more betray our sense than woman's lightness. <laughs> oh, fine, fine, fine. What dost thou, or, or what art thou, Angela? Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good? 
Oh, let her brother live. Thieves for their robbery have authority when judges steal themselves. What? Do I love her? That I desire to hear her speak again and feast upon her eyes? What is thy dream on? Oh, cunning enemy that to catch a saint with saints does bake thy hook. Most dangerous is that temptation that doth goad us on with to sin in loving virtue. Never could the strumpet with, with all her double vigor, art and nature once stir thy temp my temper, but this virtuous maid subdues me quite. Ever till now, when men were fond, I smiled and wondered how. Enter Duke disguised as a friar and the provost. Hail to you, hail to you, provost. So I think you are. I am the provost. What's your will, good friar? Bound by my charity and my blessed order, I come to visit the afflicted spirits here in the prison. Do me the common right to let me see them and to make me know the nature of their crimes that I may minister to them accordingly. Uh, I would do more than that if more were needful. Look, here comes one, a gentlewoman of mine who falling in the flaws of her own youth hath blistered her report. She's with child. And he got that sentenced, a young man, more fit to do another such offense than to die for this. When must he die? Uh, as do I think tomorrow. I have provided for you. Stay a while and you shall be conducted. Repent you, fair one, of the sin you carry. I do and bear the shame most patiently. I'll teach you how you shall arraign your conscience and try your penitence, if it be sound or hollowly put on. I'll gladly learn. Love you the man that wronged you? Oh, yes, as I love the woman that wronged him. So then it seems your most offenseful act was mutually committed. Mutually. Then was your sin of heavier kind than his. I do confess it and repent it, father. Tis meet so, daughter, but lest you do repent as that the sin hath brought you to this shame, which sorrow is always toward ourselves, not heaven, showing we would not spare heaven as we love it, but as we stand in fear. I do repent me as it is an evil and take the shame with joy. There rest. Your partner, as I hear, must die tomorrow, and I am going with instruction to him. Grace go with you, Benedicite. Must die tomorrow? Oh, injurious love! That respites me a life whose very comfort is still a dying horror. Tis pity of him. When I would pray and think, I think and pray to several subjects, heaven hath my empty words, whilst my invention, hearing not my tongue, anchors on Isabel. God in my mouth, if as if I did but only chew his name, and in my heart the strong and swelling evil of my conception, the state whereon I studied is like a good thing being often read grown seer and tedious. Yea, my gravity, wherein no man hear me, I, I take pride. Could I with boot change for an idle plume which the air beats for vain? Oh, 
place, O oh, form, how often dost thou with thy case, thy habit, wrench all from fools and tie the wiser souls to thy false seeming. Blood, thou art blood. Let's write good angel on the devil's horn. Tis not the devil's crest. Uh, how now, uh, who's there? One Isabel, a sister, desires access to you. Uh, a teacher of the way. Oh, heavens, why does my blood thus muster to my heart, making both it unable for itself and dispossessing all my other parts of necessary fitness? So play the foolish throngs with one that swoons. Come all to help him, and so stop the air by which he should revive. And even so, the general subject to a well-wished king quit their own part, and in obsequious fondness crowd to his presence where their untaught love must needs appear offense. How now, fair maid? I'm come to know your pleasure. That you might know it would much better please me than to demand what tis. Your brother cannot live. Even so, heaven keep your honor. Yet, he may live a while, and it may be as long as you or I, uh, yet he must die. Under your sentence? Yea. When I beseech you that in his reprieve longer or shorter he may be so fitted than his soul sicken not. <laughs> by these filthy vices. It were as good to pardon him that hath from nature stolen a man already made as to remit their saucy sweetness that do coin God's image in stamps that are forbid. To set down in heaven, but not in earth. Tell you so? Then I shall pose you quickly. Which had you rather? that the most just law now took your brother's life, or to redeem him, give up your body to such sweet uncleanness as she that he hath stained. Sir, believe me, I had rather give my body than my soul. Well, I, I talk not of your soul. Our compelled sins stand more for number than for account. How say you? No, I, I, I'll not warrant that, uh, for I can speak against this thing I say. Answer to this. I, now the voice of recorded law, pronounce a sentence on your brother's life. Might there not be a charity in sin to save this brother's life? Please, you to do it. I'll take this peril. To my soul, it is no sin at all, but charity. Please you to do it at peril of your soul were equal poise of sin and charity. That I do beg his life. If it be sin, heaven let me bear it. You granting of my suit, if that be sin, I'll make it my mourn prayer to have it added to the faults of mine and nothing of your answer. Nay, uh, but hear me. Your, your sense um, pursues not mine. E either you are ignorant or seem so crafty, and that's not good. Let me be ignorant and in nothing good, but graciously to know I am no better. Thus wisdom wishes to appear most bright when it doth tax itself, as, as these black masks proclaim an enshield beauty ten times louder than beauty could displayed. But mark me, to be received plain, I'll speak more gross. Your brother is to die. So? And his offense is so, as it appeared, accounting to the law upon that name. True. Admit no other way to save his life, as I subscribe not that nor any other, but in the loss of question that you his sister, finding yourself desired of such a person whose credit with the judge or your own great place 
could fetch your brother from the manacles of the all binding law, and that there were no earthly mean to save him, but that either you must lay down the treasures of your body to this supposed, or else to let him suffer, what would you do? As much for my brother as myself, that is, were I under the terms of death, the impression of keen whips I'd wear as rubies and strip myself to, bet, to death as to a bed that longing have been sick for ere I'd yield my body up to shame. And must your brother die? And twere the cheaper way. Better it were a brother died at once than a sister by redeeming him should die forever. Were not you then as cruel as the sentence that you have slandered so? Ignomy and ransom and free pardon are of two houses. Lawful mercy is nothing kin to foul redemption. You seemed of late to make the law a tyrant and rather proved the sliding of your brother a merriment rather than a vice. Oh, pardon me, my lord. It, it all falls out to have what we would have we speak not what we mean. I something do excuse the thing I hate for his advantage that I dearly love. We are all frail. Else let my brother die. If not a fettery, but only he owe and succeed thy weakness. Nay, women are frail too. Aye, as the glasses where they view themselves, which are as easy broke as they make forms. Women help heaven, men their creation mar in profiting by them. Nay, call us ten times frail, for we are soft as our complexions are and credulous to false prints. I think it well, and from this testimony of your own sex, since I suppose we are made to be no stronger than faults may shake our frames, let me be bold. I do arrest your words. Be that you are, that is, a woman. If you be more, you're not. If you be one, as you are well expressed by all external warrants, show it now by putting on the destined livery. I have no one. Gentle, my lord, let me entreat you speak the former language. Plainly conceive, I love you. My brother did love Juliet, and you tell me that he shall die for it. He shall not, Isabel, if you give me love. I know your virtue hath a license in it, which seems a little fouler than it is to pluck on others. Believe me, on mine honor, my words express my purpose. <laughs> little honor to be much believed and most pernicious purpose. Seeming, seeming, I will proclaim thee, Angelo, look for it. Sign me a present pardon for my brother, or with an outstretched throat, I'll tell the world aloud what man thou art. Who would believe thee, Isabel? My unsoiled name, the austereness of my life, my vouch against you and my place in the state, well, so your accusation overweigh that you shall stifle in your own report and smell of calumny. I have begun and now I give my sensual race the rein. Fit thy content, consent to my sharp appetite. Lay by all nicety and prolixious blushes that banish what they sue for. Redeem thy brother by yielding up thy body to my will. Or else he must not only die the death, but thy unkindness shall his death draw out to lingering sufferance. Answer me tomorrow, or by the affections that now guides me most, I'll prove a tyrant to him. As for you, say what you can, my fault or ways your truth. 
To whom should I go? Did I tell this me? O oh, perilous mouths that bear in them one and the self same tongue, either of condemnation or a proof, bidding the law make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite to follow as it draws. All to my brother, though he hath faith fallen by prompture of the blood, yet hath he in him such a mind of honor that had he 20 heads to tender down on 20 bloody blocks, he'd yield them up before his sister should her body stoop to such abhorred pollution. Then Isabel, live chaste and brother die. More than our brother is our chastity. And I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request and fit his mind to death for his soul's rest. And we're back to Measure for Measure, Act Three, Scene One. Enter the Duke as the Friar, Claudio and the Provost. So then you hope of pardon from Lord Angelo. The miserable have no other medicine, but only hope. I have hope to live and am prepared to die. Be absolute for death. Either death or life shall thereby be the sweeter. Reason thus with life. If I do lose thee, I do lose a thing that none but fools would keep. For all thy blessed youth becomes as aged and doth beg the elms of palsied eld. And when thou art old and rich, thou hast neither heat, affection, limb, nor beauty to make thy riches pleasant. What's yet in this that bears the name of life? Yet in this life lie hid more thousand deaths. Yet death we fear that makes these odds all even. I humbly thank you. To sue, to live, I find I seek to die. And seeking death, find life. Let it come on. What ho, peace here, grace and good company. Uh, who's there? Come in. I wish deserves a welcome. Dear sir, ere long, I'll visit you again. Most holy sir, I thank you. My business is a word or two with Claudio. And very welcome. Look, senor, here's your sister. Uh, provost, a word with you. As many as you please. Bring me to hear them speak where I may be concealed. Now, sister, what's the comfort? Why, as all comforts are, most good, most good indeed. Lord Angelo, having affairs to heaven, intends for you his swift ambassador, where you shall be an everlasting liger. Therefore, your best appointment make with speed. Tomorrow you set on. So is there no remedy? None but such remedy as to save a head, to cleave a heart in twain. Oh, but is there any? Yes, brother, you may live. There is a devilish mercy in the judge, if you'll implore it, that will free your life but fetter you till death. Perpetual durance? Aye, just. Perpetual durance. A restraint, though all the world's vestidity you had to a determined scope. But in what nature? In such a one as you consenting to it would bark your honor from that trunk you bear and leave you naked. Well, let me know the point. Oh, I do fear thee, Claudio. And I quake, lest thou a feverous life shouldest entertain and six or seven winters more respect than a perpetual honor. Darst thou die? The sense of death is most in apprehension, and the poor beetle that we tread upon in corporal sufferance finds a pang as great as when a giant dies. Why give you me this shame? Think you I can a resolution fetch from flowery tenderness? Well, if I must die, I will encounter darkness as a bride and hug it in mine arms. There spake my brother. There my father's grave did utter forth a voice. Yes, thou must die. Thou art too noble to conserve a life in base appliances. 
this outward sainted deputy whose settled visage and deliberate word nips youth i' the head and follies doth anew as falcon doth the fowl is yet a devil his filth within being cast he would appear a pond as deep as hell the princely angelo oh tis the cunning livery of hell dost thou think claudio if i would yield him my virginity thou mightest be free oh heavens it, it cannot be yes he would give he would give it to thee from his rank offence so to offend him still this night's the time that i should do what i abhor to name or else thou diest tomorrow oh thou shalt not do it oh were it but my life i'd throw it down for your deliverance as frankly as a pin oh, thanks dear isabel be you ready claudio for your death tomorrow yes he has affections in him that thus can make him bite the law by the nose when he would force it i'm sure it is no sin or of the deadly seven it is the very least which is the least well if it were damnable he being so wise why would he for the momentary trick be perdurably fined oh isabel what says my brother death is a fearful thing and shamed life a hateful oh, ay but to die and go we know not where to lie in cold obstruction to rot this sensible warm motion to become a, a needed clod and the delighted spirit to bathe in fiery floods and to reside in thrilling region with thick ribbed ice to, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about the pendant world or to be worse than worst of those that lawless and incertain thought imagine howling oh it is too horrible the weariest and most loathed worldly life the, the age ache penury and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death alas alas oh sweet sister let me live what sin you do to save a brother's life nature dispenses with the deed so far that it becomes a virtue oh you beast oh faithless coward oh dishonest wretch wilt thou be made a man out of my vice is it not a kind of incest to take life from thine own sister's shame what should i think heaven shield my mother played my father fair for such a warped slip of wilderness ne'er issued from his blood take my defiance die perish might but my bending down reprieve thee from thy fate it should proceed i'll pay a thousand prayers for thy death no word save thee but now hear me isabel oh fie 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 thy sin's not accidental but a trade mercy to thee would prove itself a bawd tis best that thou diest quickly oh hear me isabella vouchsafe a word young sister but one word what is your will might you dispense with your leisure i would by and by have some speech with you the satisfaction i would require is likewise your own benefit i have no superfluous leisure my stay must be stolen out of other affairs but i will attend you a while son I have overheard what hath passed between you and your sister. Angelo had never the pur purpose to corrupt her, only he had made an assay of her virtue to practice his judgment with the disposition of natures. She, having the truth of honor in her, hath made him that gracious denial which he is most glad to receive. I am confessor to Angelo, and I know this to be true. Therefore, prepare yourself to death. Do not satisfy your resolution with hopes that are fallible. Tomorrow, you must die. Go to your knees and make ready. Oh, oh, let me ask my sister pardon. I, I am so out of love with life that I will sue to be rid of it. Hold you there. Farewell. Provost, a word with you? What's your will, father? 
that now you are come, you will be gone. Leave me a while with the maid. My mind promises with my habit, no loss shall touch her by my company. In good time. The hand that hath made you fair hath made you good. The goodness that is cheap in beauty makes beauty brief in goodness. But grace, being the soul of your complexion, shall keep the body of it ever fair. The assault that Angelo hath made to you, fortune hath conveyed to my understanding. And, but that frailty hath examples for his falling, I should wonder at Angelo. How will you do to content this substitute and to save your brother? I'm now going to resolve him. I had rather my brother die by the law that my son should be unlawfully born. But oh, how much is the good Duke deceived by Angelo? If he ever return, I can and I can speak to him, I will open my lips in vain to discover his government. That shall not be much amiss. Yet, as the matter now stands, he will avoid your accusation. He made trial of you only. Therefore, fasten your ear on my advisings. To the love I have in doing good, a remedy presents itself. I do make myself believe that you may most uprightly do a poor wronged lady a merited benefit, redeem your brother from the angry law, do no stain to your own gracious person, and much please the absent duke, if peradventure he shall ever return to have hearing of this business. Let me hear you speak further. I have spirit to do anything that appears not foul in the truth of my spirit. Virtue is bold and goodness never fearful. Have you not heard speak of Mariana, the sister of Frederick, the great soldier who was carried at sea? I have heard of the lady, and good words went with her name. She, should this Angelo have married, was affianced to her oath and the nuptial appointed, between which time of the contract and limit of the solemnity, her brother Frederick was wrapped at sea, having in that perished vessel the dowry of a sister. But mark how heavily this befell to the poor gentlewoman. There she lost a noble and renowned brother, in his love toward her ever most kind and natural, with him, the portion and sinew of her fortune, her marriage di dowry, with both her combinate husband, this well-seeming Angelo. Can this be so? Did Angelo so leave her? Left her in tears and drive not one of them with his comfort, swallowed his vows whole, and he, a marvel, to her tears is washed with them but relents not what a merit were in it were it in death to take this poor maid from the world what corruption in this life that it will let this man live but how out of this can she avail it is a rupture that you may easily heal and the cure of it not only saves your brother but keeps you from dishonor in doing it Show me how, good father. This forenamed maid hath yet in her continuance of her first affection. His unjust unkindness that in all reason should have quenched her love hath, like an impediment in the current, made it more violent and unruly. Go you to Angelo, answer his requiring with a plausible obedience, agree with his demands to the point, only refer yourself to this advantage. First, that your stay with him may not be long, that the time may have all shadow and silence in it, and the place answer to convenience. This being granted in course and now follows all, we shall advise this wronged maid to go in your place. If the encounter acknowledge itself hereafter, it may compel him to her recompense. And here, by this is your brother saved, your honor untainted, the poor Mariana advantaged, and the corrupt deputy scaled. The maid will I frame and make fit for this attempt. What think you of it? 
The image of it gives me content already, and I trust it will grow to a most prosperous perfection. It lies much in your holding up. Haste you speedily to Angelo. If for this night he entreat you to his bed, give him promise of satisfaction. I will presently to St. Luke's. There at the moated grange resides this dejected Mariana. At that place, call upon me and dispatch with Angelo that it may be quickly. I thank you for this comfort. Fare you well, good father. She exits, the Duke remains. Scene two, enter elbow Pompey and officers. Nay, if there be no remedy for it, but that you will needs buy and sell men and women or beasts. He must speak with the deputy, sir. He has given him warning. The deputy cannot abide a whoremaster. I spy comfort, I cried bail. Here's a gentleman and a friend of mine. How now, noble Pompey? What is the wheels of Caesar? Art thou led in triumph? Art thou going to prison, Pompey? Yes, faith, sir. Oh, why, tis not amiss, Pompey. Farewell. Go. Say I sent thee thither. For debt, Pompey? Or what? <laughs> for being a board. For being a board. Well, then, imprison him. If imprisonment be his too as a board, why, tis his right. Bored he is, doubtless, and of antiquity too. Bored born. Farewell, good Pompey. <laughs> Commend me to the prison, Pompey. You'll turn good husband now, Pompey. <laughs> you will keep the house. <laughs> I hope, sir, your good worship will be my bail. <laughs> no, indeed, I will not, Pompey. It's not the where. I will pray, Pompey, to increase your bondage. If you take it not patiently, why, your metal is more. At you, trusty Pompey, bless you, fire. Mm. And you? Uh, you will not bail me then, sir? <laughs> then, Pompey, nor now. What's the new abroad, fire? What's the news? <laughs> Come your way, sir. Come. Go to Kento, Pompey, go. What news, fire? Of the Duke? I know none. Can you tell me of any? Oh, <laughs> some say uh, he's with the Emperor of Russia. Others, some he's in Rome. But where is he, think you? <laughs> I know not where, but wheresoever, I wish him well. <laughs> it was a mad fantastical trick of him to steal from the state and usurped the beggary he was never born to. <laughs> a Lord Angelo dukes it well in his absence. He puts transgression to it. <laughs> he does well in it. <laughs> a little more lenity to lechery would do no harm in him. Something too crabbed <laughs> in that way, hey, Friar? <laughs> it is too general a vice and severity must cure it. Yes, yes, in good sooth. But it's impossible to extirp it quite, Friar, to eating and drinking be put down. <laughs> uh, they say this Angela was not made by man and woman after this uh, downright uh, way of creation. <laughs> Is it true, think you? How should he be made then? Well, some report a sea maid spawned him. Some that he was begot between two stockfishes. <laughs> but what is certain is that when he makes water, his urine is congealed ice. <laughs> that I know to be true. Well, you are pleasant, sir, and speak apace. Why, what a ruthless thing it is in him for the rebellion of a codpiece to take away the life of a man. Would the duke that is absent have done this? Eh, he would have hanged a man for getting a hundred bastards. He would have paid for the nursing of a thousand. <laughs> he had some feeling for the sport. He knew the service, and that instructed him in mercy. Uh, I've, I've, ne I've never heard the absent duke much detected for women. He, he, he was not inclined that way. Oh, sir, you are deceived. <laughs> it's not possible. Who, not the Duke? Yes, the Duke had crochets in him. He'd be drunk too. And let me inform you. <laughs> you do him wrong, surely. Sir, 
I was an inward of his. <laughs> the shy fellow was the Duke. And I believe I know the cause of his withdrawing. <laughs> what, I prithee, might be the cause? Oh, no, oh, pardon. Tis a secret. Must be locked within the teeth and the lips. But this I can let you understand. <laughs> the greater file of the subject held the Duke to be wise. Wise? Why, the question he was. A very superficial, ignorant, unweighing fellow. Uh, either this is envy, <coughs> envy in you, folly, or, or, or mistaking. The very stream of his life and the business he hath helmed must, upon a warranted need, give him a better proclamation. Let him be but testimonied in his own bringings forth, and he shall appear to the envious a scholar, a statesman, and a soldier. Therefore, you speak unskillfully. Or if your knowledge be more, it is much darkened in your malice. <laughs> I know him, and I love him. <laughs> love talks with better knowledge, and knowledge with dearer love. Come, sir, I know what I know. I can hardly believe that, since you know not what you speak. But if ever the Duke returns, as our prayers are, he may, let me desire you to make your answer before him. Be honest you have spoke, with courage to maintain it. I am bound to call upon you, and I pray you your name. Sir, my name is Lucio, well known to the Duke. You shall know you better, sir, if I may live to report you. I fear you not. Uh. Oh, you hope the Duke will return no more? Or you imagine me too unhurtful an opposite? <laughs> but indeed, I, I can do you little harm. You'll forswear this again. <laughs> I'll be hanged first. Thou art deceived in me, friar. <laughs> but no more of this. Canst thou tell if Claudio die tomorrow or no? Why should he die, sir? Why? Fulfilling a bottle with a tundish. Uh, I would the Duke we talked of were returned again. This ungenitured agent will unpeople the province with continency. Sparrows must not build in his house ease because they are lecherous. The Duke yet would never bring them to light. I mean, the Duke uh, would have dark deeds darkly answered, and he would never bring them to light. Would he were return? Marry, this Claudio was condemned for trussing. <laughs> Farewell, good friar. I prithee thee, pray for me. The Duke, I say to thee again, would eat mutton on Fridays. <laughs> He's now past it yet, and I say to thee, he would mouth with a beggar, though she smelt brown bread and garlic. Say that I said so. Farewell. <laughs> no might nor greatness in mortality can sense your escape. Back wounding calumny, the whitest virtue strikes. What king so strong can tie the gall up in the slanderous tongue? But who comes here? <clears throat> Officers, go. Away with her to prison. Good, my lord, be good to me. Your honor is accounted a merciful man. Good, my lord. Double and treble abomination, and still forfeit in the same kind. This would make mercy swear and play the tyrant. A board of 11 years continuance. May it please your honor. My lord. Is this one Lucio's information against me? Mistress Kate, keep down, was with child by him in the Duke's time. He promised her marriage. His child is a year and a quarter old. Nay, and I have kept it myself. And see how he goes about to abuse me. That fellow is a fellow of much license. Let him be called before us. Away with her to prison. Go to, no more words. Provost, my brother Angelo, will not be altered. Claudio must die tomorrow. 
let him be furnished with the vines and have all charitable preparations. If my brother wrought by my pity, it should not be so with him. So please you, this friar hath been with him and advised him for the entertainment of death. Good evening, good father. Listen, goodness on you. Of whence are you? Not of this country, though my chance is now to use it for my time. I am a brother of gracious order, late come from the sea, in special business from his holiness. I pray you, sir, of what disposition was the Duke? Above that, above all other strifes, contended especially to know himself. What pleasure was he given to? Rather rejoicing to see another merry than merry at any time, which professed to make him rejoice. The gentleman of all temperance. But leave we, but leave we him to his events with a prayer that they may prove prosperous. And let me desire to know how you, Claudio, prepared. I am made to understand that you have lent him visitation. He professes to have received no sinister measure from his judge, but most willingly humbles himself to the determination of justice. Yet had he framed to himself by the instruction of his frailty, many deceiving promises of life, which I, by my good leisure, have discredited to him. And now he is resolved to die. You have paid the heavens for your function and the prisoner the very depth of your calling. I have labored for the good gentleman to the extremest shore of my modesty. But my brother Justice have I found so severe that he hath forced me to tell him he is indeed Justice. If his own life answer the straightness of his proceeding, it shall become him well, wherein, if he chance to fail, he hath sentenced himself. I'm going to visit the professor. There you well. Peace be with you. Twice treble shame on Angelo to weed my vice and let his grow. Oh, what man, what may man hide within him hide, thou angel on the outward side? Craft against vice I must apply with Angelo tonight shall lie his old betrothed but despised. So disguise shall by the disguised pay with falsehood false exacting and perform an old contracting. Duke exits. Enter Mariana starting to sing. Take, go oh, take those lips away that so sweetly were forsworn. Oh, I, I cry you mercy, sir, and well could wish you had not found me here so musical. Let me excuse me, and believe me so. My mirth it much displeased, but pleased my woe. Tis good, the music oft hath such a charm to make bad good and good provoke to harm. I pray you tell me, hath anybody inquired for me here today? Much upon this time have I promised here to meet. You have not been inquired after. I have sat here all day. I do constantly believe you. The time has come even now. I, I, I shall crave your forbearance a little. Maybe I will call upon you anon for some advantage to yourself. I am always bound to you. Very well met and welcome. What is the news from this good deputy? He hath a garden circumferred with brick, whose western side is with a vineyard backed. And to that vineyard is a planted gate that makes his opening with this bigger key. This other doth command a little door, which from the vineyard to the garden leads. There have I made my promise upon the heavy middle of the night to call upon him. Are there no other tokens between you greed concerning her observance? No, none, but only the repair in the dark and that I have possessed him, my most stay can be but brief, for I have made him know I have a servant comes with me along that stays upon me, whose persuasion is I come about my brother. Tis well borne up. 
I have not yet made known to Mariana a word of this. What ho, within, come forth. I pray you be acquainted with this maid. She comes to do you good. I do desire the like. Do you persuade yourself that I respect you? Good friar, I know you do and have found it. Take then this your companion by the hand who hath a story ready for your ear. I shall attend your leisure, but make haste, the vaporous night approaches. Will it please you walk aside? Oh, place and greatness. Millions of false eyes are stuck upon me. Volumes of report run with these false and most contrarious quest upon thy doings. Thousand escapes of wit make thee the father of thy their idle dream and rack thee in their fancies. Welcome. How agreed? She'll take the enterprise upon her father, if you advise it. It is not my consent, but my entreaty, too. Little have you to say, but when you depart from him, soft and low, remember now, my brother. Fear me not. Nor gentle daughter, Fear you not at all. He is your husband on a pre-contract. To bring you thus together, tis no sin, sith that the justice of your title to him doth flourish the deceit. Come, let us go, our corns to reap, for yet our tithes to sow. They exit. Scene two, enter provost and an officer. Call hither Barnardine and Claudio. The one has my pity, not a jot the other, being a murderer, though he were my brother. Look, <clears throat> here's the warrant, Claudio, for thy death. Tis now dead midnight, and by eight tomorrow thou must be made immortal. But where is Barnadine? As fast locked up in sleep as guiltless labor, when it lies starkly in the traveler's bones, he will not wake. Who can do good on him? Well, go on, prepare yourself. But hark, what noise? <sighs> Heaven give you spirits of comfort. By and by, I hope it is some pardon or reprieve for the most gentle Claudio. Uh, welcome, Father. The best and wholesomest spirits of the night envelop you, good provost. Who called here of late? None since the curfew rung. Not Isabel. No. They will then, ere it be long. What comfort is for Claudio? There's some in hope. It is a bitter deputy. Not so, not so. He doth with holy abstinence subdue that in himself which he spurs on his power to qualify in others. Were he kneeled with that which he corrects, then were he tyrannous. But this being so, he's just. Now are they come. That is a gentle provost. Seldom when the steely jailer is the friend of men. Have you no countman for Claudio yet, but he must die tomorrow? None, sir, none. As near the dawning, provost, as it is, you shall hear more ere morning. Happily you something know, yet I believe there comes no countermand. No such example have we. Besides, upon the very siege of justice, Lord Angelo hath to the public ear professed the contrary. Ah, this is his lordship's man. And here comes Claudio's pardon. My lord hath sent you this order, and by me this further charge, that you swerve not from the small, smallest article of it, neither in time, matter, or other circumstance. Good morrow, for as I take it, it is almost day. I shall obey him. This is his pardon, purchased by such sin for which the pardoner himself is in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, sir, mm -hmm. what news? 
I, I told you. Lord Angelo, belike thinking me remiss in mine office, awakens me with this unwanted putting on, methinks strangely, for he hath not used it before. Pray you, let's hear. Whatsoever you may hear to the contrary, let Claudio be executed by four of the clock, and in the afternoon, Barnardine. For my better satisfaction, let me have Claudio's head sent me by five. Let this be duly performed with a thought that more depends on it than we must yet deliver. Thus, fail not to do your office, or you will answer it at your peril. <laughs> what say you to this, sir? What is that Barnardine who is to be executed in the afternoon? A bohemian born, but here nursed up and bred, one that is a prisoner of nine years old. Hath he borne himself penitently in prison? How seems he to be touched? <laughs> drunk many times a day, if not many days entirely drunk. We have very often wakened him, as if to carry him to execution and showed him a seeming warrant for it. It hath not moved him at all. More of him anon. There is written in your brow, provost, honesty and constancy, if I read it not truly, and my ancient skill beguiles me. But in the boldness of my cunning, I will lay myself in hazard. Claudio, whom here you have warrant to execute, is no greater forfeit to the law than Angelo, who hath sentenced him. To make you understand this in a manifested effect, I crave but four days respite, for the which you are to do me both a present and dangerous courtesy. Pray, sir, in, in what? In delaying the death. Alack, how may I do it, having the hour limited and an express command under penalty to deliver his head in view of Angelo? I may make my case as Claudio's to cross this in the smallest by the vow of mine order, I warrant you, if my instructions may be your guide. Look you, sir, here is the hand and seal of the Duke. You know the character, I doubt not, and the signet is not strange to you. I know them both. The contents of this is the return of the Duke. You shall anon overread it at your pleasure, where you shall find within these two days he will be here. This is a thing that Angelo knows not, for he this very day received letters of strange tenor, perchance of the Duke's death, perchance entering into some monastery, but by chance nothing of what is writ. Look, the unfolding star calls up the shepherd. Put not yourself into amazement how these things should be. All difficulties are but easy when they are known. Come away, it is almost clear dawn. I'll make all speed. Peace ho be here. The tongue of Isabel. She's come to know if yet her brother's pardon be come hither. But I will keep her ignorant of her good to make her heavenly comforts of despair when it is least expected. Oh, by your leave. Good morning to you, fair and gracious daughter. The better given me by so holy a man hath yet the deputy sent my brother's pardon he hath released him isabel from the world his head is off and sent to angelo nay but it is not so it is no other show your wisdom daughter in your close patience Oh, I will chew him and pluck out his eyes. You shall not be admitted to a sight. Unhappy Claudio, wretched Isabel, injurious world, most damned Angelo. This nor hurts him nor profits you a jot. Forbear it, therefore. Give your cause to heaven. Mark what I say, which you shall find by every syllable a faithful verity. The Duke comes home tomorrow. Nay, dry your eyes. One of our convent and his confessor gives me this instance. 
Already, he hath carried notice to Aeschylus and Angelo, who do prepare to meet him at the gates, there to give up their power. If you can, pace your wisdom in that good path that I wish it would go, and you shall have your bosom on this wretch, grace of the Duke, revenges to your heart and general honor. I am directed by you. This letter then to Friar Peter give, tis that he sent me of the Duke's return. Say by this token, I desire his company at Mariana's house tonight. Her cause and yours, I'll perfect him with all, and he shall bring you before the Duke and to the head of Angelo, accuse him home and home. For my poor self, I am combined by a sacred vow and shall be absent. Wend you with this letter. Command these fretting waters from your eyes with a light heart. Trust not my holy order if I pervert your course. Who's here? Even friar, where's the provost? Not within, sir. Oh, pretty Isabella, I am pale at mine heart to see thine eyes so red. Uh, thou must be patient. But they say the Duke will be here tomorrow. By thy troth, Isabel, I love thy brother. If the old fantastical Duke of Dark Corners had been at home, he'd had lived. Sir, the Duke is marvellous little beholding to your reports. But the best is, he lives not in them. Oh, friar, thou knowest not the Duke as well as I do. He's a better woodsman than you takest him for. Well, you'll answer this one day. Fare you well. Uh, nay, Tarry, I'll go along with thee. I can tell thee pretty tales of the Duke. You have told me too many of him already, sir, if they be true. If not true, none were enough. <laughs> I was once before him for getting a wench with child. Did you such a thing? Yes, Mary, I did. But I was fain to forswear it. They would else have married me to the rotten meddler. <laughs> Sir, your company is fairer than honest. Rest you well. By my troth, I'll go with thee to the lane's end. If body talk offends you, we'll have very little of it. <laughs> Nay, friar. I'm a kind of poor, <laughs> I shall stick. They exit, scene three, enter Angelo and Aeschylus. Every letter he hath writ hath disvouched other. In most uneven and distracted manner, his actions show much like to madness. Pray heaven his wisdom be not tainted. And why meet him at the gates and deliver our authorities there? I guess not. And, and why should we proclaim it in an hour before his entering that if any crave redress of injustice, they should exhibit their petitions in the street? He shows his reason for that, to have a dispatch of complaints and to deliver us from devices hereafter, which shall then have no power to stand against us. Well, I beseech you, let it be proclaimed. Uh, be times of the morn, I'll call at you, you at your house. Uh, give notice to such men of sword and suit as are to meet him. I shall, sir. Fare you well. Good night. This deed unshapes me quite, makes me unpregnant and dull to all proceedings. A deflowered maid, and by the eminent body that enforced the law against it, but that her tender shame will not proclaim her maiden loss. How? Might she tongue me? Yet reason dares her no, for my authority bears of a credent bulk that no particular scandal once can touch. It confounds the breather. He should have lived, save that his riotous youth with dangerous sense might in the times to come have tamed revenge by so receiving a dishonored life with ransom of such shame. Would yet he had lived. Alack, once our grace we have forgot, nothing goes right. We would and we would not. Scene six, enter Isabella and Mariana. To speak so indirectly, I am loath. 
I would say the truth, but to accuse him so, that is your part. Yet I am advised to do it, he says to veil full purpose. Be ruled by him. Besides, he tells me that if peradventure he speak against me on the adverse side, I should not think it strange, for tis a physic that's bitter to sweet end. I would, Friar Peter. Oh, peace. The friar is come. Come, I have found you out a stand most fit, where you may have such advantage on the duke. He shall not pass you. Twice have the trumpets sounded. The generous and gravest citizens have hence the gates, and very near upon that duke is entering. Thence, hence, therefore, hence away. Act five, scene one. Enter Duke, Angelo, Aeschylus, Lucio, Provost, officers and citizens. My very worthy cousin fairly met. Our old and faithful friend, we are glad to see you. Happy, Happy return, return be your, your royal grace. grace. Many and hearty thankings to you both. We have made inquiry of you and we hear such goodness of your justice that our soul cannot but yield forth to public thanks for running more requital. You make my bond still greater. Oh, your desert speaks loud and I should wrong it to lock it in the wards of covert bosom. Come, Aeschylus, you must walk by us on our other hand and good support as you be. Now is your time. Speak loud and kneel before him. Justice, O royal duke, veil your regard upon a wronged, I would fain have said a maid. O worthy prince, dishonor not your eye by throwing it on any other object till you have heard me in my true complaint and given me justice, 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 justice. Relate your wrongs. In what? By whom? Be brief. Here is Lord Angelo shall give you justice. Reveal yourself to him. O oh, worthy Duke, you bid me seek redemption of the devil. Hear me yourself, for that which I must speak must either punish me, not being believed, or wring redress from you. Hear me, oh, hear me here. Uh, my lord, uh, her wits, I fear me, are not firm. She hath been a suitor to me for her brother, uh, cut off by the course of justice. By course of justice. And she will speak most bitterly and strange. Most strange, but yet most truly I will speak. For that Angelo's forsworn, is it not strange? That Angelo's a murderer, is it not strange? That Angelo's an adulterous thief, a hypocrite, a virgin violator, is it not strange and strange? Oh, nay, it is ten times strange. Is it not truer he is Angelo, then this is all as true as it is strange. Nay, it is ten times true, for truth is truth to the end of reckoning. Away with her, poor soul. She speaks this in the infirmity of sense. Oh, prince, I conjure thee, as thou believest there is another comfort than this world, that thou neglect me not with that opinion that I am touched with madness. Make not impossible that which but seems unlike. Tis not impossible, but one the wickedest caitiff on the ground may seem as shy, as grave, as just, as absolute as Angelo. Even so may Angelo in all his dressings, carracks, titles, forms, be an arch villain. Believe it, royal prince, if he be less, he's nothing. But he's more, had I more name for badness. By mine honesty, if she be mad, as I believe no other, her madness hath the oddest frame of sense. Many that are not mad, <laughs> Your more lack of reason. What would you say? I am the sister of one Claudio, condemned upon the act of fornication to lose his head, condemned by Angelo. I, in probation of a sisterhood, was sent to by my brother, one Lucio, as then the messenger. You're muted, Kevin. Okay.
<laughs> yes, that is I. And it, like you guys, it came from Claudio and desired to try her gracious fortune with Lord Angelo for her poor brother's pardon. That's he indeed. You were bid not to speak. Uh, no, my good lord, nor wish to hold my peace. I wish you now, then. This gentleman told somewhat of my tale. <laughs> right. It may be right, but you are in the wrong to speak before your time. Proceed. I went to this pernicious caitiff deputy. That's somewhat madly spoken. Pardon it. The phrase is to the matter. Mend it again. The, the matter, proceed. In brief, to set the needless process by, how I persuaded him, how I prayed and kneeled, how he refelled me, and how I replied, for this was of much length. The vile conclusion I now begin with grief and shame to utter. He would not, but by gift of my chaste body to his <laughs> Conscutable, intemperate lust release my brother, and after much debatement, my sisterly remorse confutes mine honor, and I yield to him. But the next morn betimes, his purpose surfeiting, he sends a warrant for my poor brother's head. By heaven, fond wretch, thou knowst not what thou speakst, or else thou art suborned against his honor in hateful practice. The first. His integrity stands without blemish. Next, it imports no reason that with such vehemency he should pursue faults proper to himself. If he had so offended, he would have weighed thy brother by himself and not have cut him off. Someone hath set you on. Confess the truth and say by whose advice thou camest here to complain. And is this all? Then, oh, you blessed ministers above, Keep me in patience, and with ripened time unfold the evil which is here wrapped up, as I, thus wronged, hence unbelieved go. I know you'd fain be gone. An officer to prison with her. Shall we thus permit a blasting and scandalous breath to fall on him so near us? This needs must be a practice. Who knew of your intent in coming hither? One that I were here, Friar Lodwick. A ghostly father belike. Who knows that Lodwick? Uh, my lord, I know him. <laughs> Tis a meddling friar. I do not like the man. Had he been lay, my lord, for certain words he spake against your grace in retirement, I'd swinged him sound. But... What against me? This a good friar belike? than to set on this wretched woman here against our substitute. Let this friar be found. Uh, but yesterday, my lord, she and that friar, I saw them at prison. A saucy friar, a very scurvy fellow. Know you that friar Lodewick that she speaks of? I know him <laughs> for a man divine and holy. Not scurvy, nor a temporary meddler, as he's reported by this gentleman, and on my trust, a man that never yet did, as he vouches, misreport your grace. <laughs> my lord, most villainously believe it. Well, he in time may come to clear himself, but at this instant he is sick, my lord, of a strange fever. Upon his mere request, being come to knowledge that there was a complaint intended against Lord Angelo, came I hither to speak as from his mouth. First, for this woman to justify this worthy nobleman, at so vulgarly and personally accused, her shall you hear disapprove to her eye, disapproved it to her eyes till she herself confess it. Good friar, let's hear it. Come, cousin Angelo, in this I'll be impartial. Be you judge of your own cause. Is this the witness, friar? First, let her show her face and after speak. Pardon, my lord, I, I will not show my face until my husband bid me. What, are you married? No, my lord. Are you maid? No, my lord. 
A widow, then? Neither, my lord. Why, you are nothing, then, neither maid, widow, nor wife. My lord, she may be a punk, for many of them are neither maid, widow, nor wife. Oh, silence that fellow. I would he had some cause to prattle for himself. I will, my lord. My lord, I do confess I ne'er was married. And I confess, besides, I am no maid. I have known my husband, yet my husband knows not that he ever knew me. He was a drunk then, my lord. It can be no better. For the benefit of silence, would thou wert so too. <laughs> well, my lord. This is no witness for Lord Angelo. Now I come to it, my lord. She that accuses him of fornication in self-same manner doth accuse my husband and charges him, my lord, with such a time when I'll depose, I had him in mine arms with all the effect of love. Charges she more than me? Not that I know. No, you say your husband. Why, just my lord, and that is Angelo, who thinks he knows that he ne'er knew my body, but knows he thinks that he knows Isabel's. Th this is a strange abuse. Let's see thy face. My husband bids me. Now I will unmask. This is that face, thou cruel Angelo, which once thou swore it was worth the looking on. This is the hand with which vowed contract was fast be locked in thine. This is the body that took away the match from Isabel and did supply thee at thy garden house in her imagined person. Know you this woman? Carnally, she says. Sirrah, no more. <laughs> My lord, I, I, I must confess, I, I know this woman, and five years since, there was some speech of marriage betwixt myself and her, which was broke off partly for that her promised proportions came short of composition, but in chief, for that her reputation was disvalued in levity. Since which time of five years, I, I never spake with her, saw her, nor heard from her, upon my faith and honor. Noble prince, as there come light from heaven and words from breath, as there is sense in truth and truth in virtue, I am a fiance this man's wife as strongly as words could make up vows. And my good Lord, but Tuesday night, last gone in Garden's house, he knew me as a wife. As this is true, let me in safety raise me from my knees or else forever be confixed here a marble monument. I could smile till now. Now, good my lord, give me the scope of justice. My patience here is touched. I do perceive these poor informal women are no more but instruments of some more mightier member that sets them on. But let me have way, my lord, to find this practice out. I, with my heart, you, Lord Aeschylus, sit with my cousin, lend him your kind pains to find out this abuse, whence tis derived. There is another friar that set them on. Let him be sent for. Would he be here, my lord, if he indeed hath set the women on to this complaint? Your provost knows the place where he abides, and he may fetch him. Go, do it instantly. And you, my noble and well-warranted cousin, whom it concerns to hear this matter forth, do with your injuries as seems you best in any chastisement. I for a while will leave you, but stir you not till you have well determined upon these slanderers. My lord, <clears throat> we'll do it thoroughly. Signor Lucio, you did not say you knew the friar Lodwick to be a dishonest person. <laughs> Honesty nothing, and one that hath spake most villainous speeches of the duke. We shall entreat you to abide here till he come and enforce them against him. We shall find this friar a notable fellow. As any in Vienna, on my word. Call that same Isabel here once again. I would speak with her. 
pray you, my lord, give me leave to question. You shall see how I handle her. <laughs> no better than he, by her own report. <laughs> uh, come on, mistress. Here's a gentlewoman denies all that you have said. Uh, my lord, here comes the rascal I spoke of. Here with the provost. In very good time. Speak not you to him till we call upon you. Mum. Come, sir. Did you set these women on to slander Lord Angelo? They have confessed you did. Tis false. How? Know you where you are? Where is the Duke? Tis he should hear me speak. The Duke's in us, and we will hear you speak. You look, you speak justly. Boldly, at least. But, oh, poor souls. Come you to seek the lamb here of the fox? Good night to your redress. Is the Duke gone? Then is your cause gone too? The Duke's unjust thus to retort your manifest appeal and put your trial in the villain's mouth, which here you come to accuse. This is the rascal. This is he I spoke of. Slander to the state. Away with him to prison. What uh, can you vouch against him, Signor Lucio? Uh, is this the man you did tell us of? <laughs> Tis he, my lord. Come hither, Goodman Baldplate. <laughs> Do you know me? <laughs> I remember you, sir, by the sound of your voice. I met you at the prison in the absence of the Duke. Oh, did you so? And do you remember what you said of the Duke? Most notably, sir. But do you so, sir? And was the Duke a fleshmonger, a fool, a coward, as you then reported him to be? You must, sir, change persons with me ere you make that my report. You, indeed, spoke so of him, and much more, much worse. Oh, oh, oh thou damnable fellow! Did not I pluck thee by thy nose for thy speeches? I protest I love the Duke as much as I love myself. <laughs> come, sir, come, sir, come, some Sir Frost, sir. Why, you bald pitted lying rascal, you must be hooded, must you? Oh, show your knaves, Miss oh, Will the pox to you? Will not off? Why, I. Oh, oh. <gasps> Thou art the first knave that e'er maids to duke. Sneak not away, sir, for the friar and you must have a word anon. Lay hold on him. This may prove worse than hanging. Sir, by your leave, hast thou a word or wit or impudence that can yet do the office? If thou hast, rely upon it till my tale be heard and hold no longer out. Oh, oh, my dread lord, I, I should be guiltier than my guiltiness to think I can be undiscernible when I perceive your grace, like, like power divine, hath looked upon my passes. Then, good prince, no longer session hold upon my shame, but let my trial be mine own confession. Immediate sentence then and sequent death is, is all the grace I beg. Come here, the Mariana. Say, wast thou e'er contracted to this woman? I was, my lord. Go take her heads and marry her instantly. Do you the office, friar, which consummate, return him here. Go with him, provost. My lord, I am more amazed at his dishonor than at the strangeness of it. Come hither, Isabel. Your friar is now your prince as I was there advertising and wholly to your business, not changing heart with habit. I am still attorney at your service. Oh, give me pardon that I, your vessel, have employed and pained your unknown sovereignty. Your brother's death, I know, sits at your heart, and you may marvel why I obscured myself laboring to save his life and would not rather make rash remonstrance of my hidden power than let him be so lost. Oh, most kind maid, it was the swift celerity of his death, which I did think with slower foot came on. For this new married man approaching here, 
whose salt imagination yet hath wronged your well-defended honor, you must pardon for Mariana's sake. But as he adjudged your brother being criminal in double violation of sacred chastity and of promise breach, the very mercy of the law cries out, and Angelo for Claudio, death for death. Haste still pays haste, and leisure answers leisure, like doth quit like, and measure still for measure. Then, Angelo, thy faults thus manifested, which, though thou wouldst deny, denies thee vantage. We do condemn thee to the very block where Claudio stooped to death, and with like haste. Away with him. Oh, my most gracious lord, I hope you will not mock me with a husband. It is your husband mocked you with a husband. Consenting to the safeguard of your honor, I thought your marriage fit. Else, imputation for that he knew you might reproach your life and choke your good to come. For his possessions, although by confiscation they are ours, we do instate and widow, widow you withal to buy you a better husband. Oh, my dear Lord, I crave no other nor no better man. Never crave him. We are definitive. Gentle, my liege. You do but lose your labor. Away with him to death. Now, sir, to you. Oh, my good Lord, sweet Isabel, take my part. Lend me your knees and all my life to come. I'll lend you all my life to do you service. Oh, Isabel, will you not lend a knee? He dies for Claudio's death. Most bounteous, sir. Look, if it please you, on this man condemned as if my brother lived. I partly think a due sincerity governed his deeds till he did look on me. Since it is so, let him not die. My brother had but justice in that he did the thing for which he died. For Angelo, his act did not o'ertake his bad intent and must be buried but as an intent that perished by the way. Thoughts are no subjects, intents but merely thoughts. Merely, my lord. Your suit's unprofitable. Stand up, I say. I have bethought me of another fault. Provost, how came it Claudio was beheaded at an unusual hour? It was commanded so. Had you a special warrant for the deed? No, my good lord. I, it was a private message. For which I do discharge you of your office. Give up your keys. Uh, pardon me, noble lord. I, I thought it was a fault, but I knew it not. Yet did repent me after more advice for testimony whereof one is the prisoner that should be by private order else have died, I have reserved alive. Oh, go fetch him hither. Let me look upon him. Go I am so, I am so sorry that so learned and so wise as you, Lord Angelo, have still appeared should slip so grossly, both in the heart, the heat of blood and lack the tempered judgment afterward. I'm sorry that such sorrow I procure, and so deep sticks it in my penitent heart that I crave death more willingly than mercy. Tis my deserving, and I do entreat it. Enter provost and a man muffled. What muffled fellow is that? This is another prisoner that I saved who should have died when Claudio lost his head. As like almost Claudio as himself. If he be like your brother, for his sake is he pardoned, and for your lovely sake, give me your hand and say you will be mine. He is my brother too. But fit a time for that. By this, Lord Angelo perceives he's safe. He thinks I see a quickening in his eye. Well, Angelo, your evil quits you well. Look that you love your wife, her worth worth yours. 
I find an apt remission in myself. And yet, here's one in place I cannot pardon. You, sirrah, that knew me for a fool, a coward, one of all luxury, an ass, a madman. Wherein have I so deserved of you that you extol me, sir? Uh, faith, my lord, I spoke it, but according to the trick. <laughs> you will hang me for it. But you may, but I had uh, uh, rather it would please you, I might be whipped. <laughs> whipped first, sir, and then hanged after. Proclaim it, provost, round about the city. If any woman wronged by this lewd fellow, as I have heard him swear himself, there's one whom he begot with child, let her appear, and he shall marry her. The nuptial finished, let him be whipped and hanged. Oh, 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 I beseech your highness, do not marry me to a whore. Your highness said even now that I made you a duke. Good my lord, do not recompense me in making me a cuckold. Upon mine honour thou shalt marry her. <laughs> Marrying upon my lord is pressing to death, whipping and danging. Slandering a prince deserves it. She, Claudio, that you wronged, Look you restore. Joy to you, Mariana. Love her, Angelo. I have confessed her, and I know her virtue. Thanks, good friend, Aeschylus, for thy much goodness. There's more behind that, is more gratulate. Thanks, provost, for thy care and secrecy. We shall employ thee in a worthier place. Dear Isabel, I have a motion much imports your good, whereto, if you'll a willing ear incline, what's mine is yours, and what is yours is mine. So uh, bring us to our palace, where we'll show what's yet behind that's meet you all should know. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.